Hey, I'm your host, Mike Gelb, and this is the Consumer VC Podcast, where we discuss the intersection of venture capital and consumer innovation. If you're enjoying the show, also subscribe to my newsletter at theconsumervc.com for all episodes directly to your inbox and a weekly roundup of all consumer venture deals happen. All content and episodes are for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not investment advice. Before we get into today's episode, I want to tell you about AVenture, a new platform that's about to launch that's making venture capital available to the masses. It doesn't matter if you're accredited or non-accredited. AVenture provides an opportunity to diversify your investment portfolio and invest in private funds. If you're a fund manager, the AVenture app also provides everything you need in order to make startup investments, including extensive research materials, seamless transaction processes, and allocation measures so you can properly diversify your portfolio. Now, typically, venture capital and startup investments are liquid, which is a major pain point for industry. AVenture is fixing this by offering periodic withdrawals for its investors. I and many others in this industry are so excited about this launch, they are preparing to list their first fund in the beginning of next year. So if you want to be the first to know, join their waitlist at aventure.vc. Thank you, Taylor Foxman, for the introduction to our guest today, Amy Sedman. Amy is a COO of Beatbox Beverage, the world's tastiest portable party punch. We discuss how Beachbox and the story of Beachbox was influenced and inspired by music and music festivals, why changing how Beatbox was packaged was a huge unlock, how they were able to get on Shark Tank and their approach to fundraising outside capital, as well as creating different brands versus focusing on one. Without further ado, here's Amy. Amy, thank you so much for joining me here today. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Doing great. Thanks for thanks for coming on the show. Um, wanted to talk about you know starting from very very the the very beginning um, with Beatbox. How did you meet Justin and Brad, and what was kind of like the founding story of how you all came together to actually found the company? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually uh, met Justin in Entrepreneurship Club at the Macomb School of Business. We were both getting our MBAs in entrepreneurship. And so we were both vice president of Entrepreneurship Society. I was actually there. I had an online marketing agency that I had started as a young adult and was trying to grow that business. And then Justin and his friends, Brad, Jason, and Dan had this idea to make boxed wine less boring. And so my first project with him was making him a website because that's what I did for a living was online marketing. But then we started working together more closely. Um, I was also a DJ on the student radio station at UT Austin. And so You know, Justin, uh, Jason, Dan, Brad and I are always like the, you know, the friends in the group that wanted to go to concerts and music festivals every weekend. And so music was definitely like the center of our social lives. And we wanted to create, um, you know, a brand that was really centered around bringing people together around music. You know, music brings everybody together globally. And that was something that we really loved. The ethos of music festivals and the togetherness that it didn't matter you know, what, uh, you know, gender or race or sexual orientation or anything like at a music festival, everybody's friends and uh, just jamming out, having a good time. And so that was kind of the ethos behind uh, the Beatbox brand. But I mean, basically we saw boxed wine at every tailgate, floating the river, you know, at every party. But this is 2010, 2011. And the stuff that we actually really liked drinking was you know, those flavored items. I was drinking a lot of Bud Light Lime Maritas back then, I think. And, uh, you know, my friends were drinking homemade punch and those kinds of things. So what we would call an RTD today, but back then um, it wasn't really a category yet. And so we said, what if we took boxed wine format, uh, created a brand around music and then created a liquid that was something that we actually liked to drink, like a party punch type flavor. And so that was the initial original idea behind Beatbox. Because we were in business school, uh, we created like a ton of prototypes. We were studying the concept of the lean startup in our classes. And, you know, every marketing class, every student pitch slam competition, we were always, you know, working on Beatbox, trying to create the, the business model. And then we started, we made a small facility where, Uh, My partners and I all made the product by ourselves before we graduated. So 
lots of figuring out the the winery rules and all the compliance stuff, as we know in our business, like uh, new to the industry, obviously it's, it's a lot to figure out, but eventually we did like our first production runs and got it into some stores here in Austin and Texas. And uh, I still had a day job at the time, but we would do those, you know, demos every weekend in the store, trying to get people to check it out and try it. And, and everybody kept saying, you guys should go on Shark Tank. You should go on Shark Tank. And so um, in 2014, we had gotten some momentum with the business with, you know, launching in a grocery chain here in Texas called HEB, which everybody in our industry probably knows about. Um, and then also, uh, you know, just outsourcing manufacturing and, and needing money for production runs and to grow the business. As you know, beverage consumer business is not an inexpensive business to run, right? So we set out to do some fundraising around that time and then, you know, applied to Shark Tank and then had the amazing opportunity to be on the show in summer 2014, um, you know, about a year after we had launched uh, just making it ourselves. So that was like a really lucky head start to start the company. Yeah, I would love to kind of know and understand like why why you first fundraised. It was it's a very capital intensive business. Uh, but um, what was that experience like? What were what were what, what what were I guess investors' concerns about Beatbox, and how are you able to r- raise your first round? Yeah, so we we started the company with our own savings. You know, I was in my early twenties, so I didn't have a lot, but uh, we got the company up and running with just our own savings as the founders. And then once we got a big production run uh, that we needed to do for that HEB order that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we actually got a friends and family debt round for about $150,000 to be able to do that production run and get those sales going. And then we knew we actually needed to do like a series seed round. So we were going to fundraise, you know, we didn't know if we were going to get on Shark Tank or not, obviously. So we were starting to talk to, you know, high net worth individuals that were in our network. And here in Austin, you know, we have such a great community of entrepreneurs and and investors as well. And so we were doing some networking, but we got the opportunity to be on Shark Tank. So that was actually considered our first fundraising round was the million dollar investment that Mark Cuban made into the business. But that wasn't the only money we needed to raise. As you know, we've done several rounds from there. And most of those funds have come in through high net worth individuals still. Um, I think that, you know, beverage alcohol startups, especially um, you know, and it, creating a new category, doing something brand new with new founders. It's just a very high risk investment for your average investor that, you know, it, it really requires um, somebody that is going to take a risk uh, on you. And so they have to believe in you as the founder. And so building relationships is really important. And then, of course, leveraging the credibility of you know, a partner like Mark Cuban or, you know, your early wins, like for us was getting into those grocery chains, having a co-packer set up already, all the legal stuff that we needed to get done. We basically tried to make it because it's already so inherently risky as an investment, but just based on, you know, how difficult it is and and to do, you know, a startup in our industry. um, I think it's just important to de-risk it as much as possible as the founder trying to go out there and raise. But uh, you know, we've, we've done a, a million coffee shop meetings, a million Zoom meetings with angel investors to raise our rounds. It's always been a lot of smaller checks. And, um, you know, we do have a few major investors now that have put in quite a lot. But most of the funds raised, especially until this year, were all smaller checks from high net worth individuals. That's awesome. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing as well as, um, I guess, your approach to um, when it comes to fundraising, um, looking for, I guess, high, ner- high net worth individuals, also probably people that have, um, looking at some of the names in your cap table, people that actually have um, alcohol experience and actually can be, you know, um, strategics or actually be helpful um, w- w- when it comes to beatbox. Um, how, I, I remember you said that you got into, you know, grocery pretty early on um, a few stores, but I know that, and I know that a big part of your brand um, is definitely music. And you definitely wanted to incorporate that in your brand as much as possible and maybe music festivals um, as well. How did you think about also approaching, I know this is maybe a bit foreign to us today because there hasn't really been music festivals for the past couple of years, but how did you think about in, um, you know, the mid, mid to late 2010s, 
how did you also think about maybe partnering with music festivals and where your ideal customer was? Right. So we set out to create a brand for our generation, the next generation, right, with this music festival ethos. So since it was really born out of that environment, we saw the brand being built. You know, a lot of people think about like a trip to Napa Valley with their favorite winery out there. And once you do the experience, you do the tour and you try all the wines, you come home talking about it to all of your friends and what a great experience for us. So so for us, the equivalent of that is tasting beatbox at a music festival. With all, you're with all your friends, you're having a great time, you know, you're, the, the beatbox drink, you know, makes it more enjoyable. It's delicious. It's helping you, you know, have fun with all your friends. And so um, that's kind of the equivalent. You know, a lot of alcohol beverage brands are built on premise and bars and things like that. And that's not really what Beatbox's strategy has been. It's been more around uh, creating those brand moments and music environments like music venues and festivals. So every single, you know, from when we started, you know, we were sponsoring the local shows at, you know, the smallest clubs that we could find in Austin, anything that we could you know, provide product or do cheaply or just show up and, and add to the experience that we could. And then, you know, this year we're doing some of the biggest music festivals in the world, like uh, Electric Daisy Carnival in Las Vegas and Rolling Loud, you know, really big festivals. So it's been really fun to, to do all kinds of different music events. That's awesome. That's um, um, that's that's really cool. Also to see, I guess, the trajectory. Um, I know um, on Shark Tank, you know, there's there's a Shark Tank bump, especially when you get um, uh, when you actually what, when investors on the show actually do invest in your company, which I know, as you said, Mark, Mark Cuban gave you all a million dollar check. Has it always been kind of a steady, steady growth since or or was there a period in your business that also like were kind of flatlined or or teetered? Yeah. So the alcohol beverage industry is very unique in that, you know, we have to go through the three tiers. So unlike a, you know, a scrub daddy, that's a lightweight, something that's easy to ship online, you know, Shark Tank product. Um, it's a little different for Beatbox to activate in the same way. You know, we were only in a hundred stores when we were on Shark Tank. So it was really hard to feel the Shark Tank effect at retail. However, um, you know, I think it did help a lot on the B2B side, you know, it gave us a lot of credibility when talking to chains, when talking to wholesalers. And so right out the gate, we got into a lot more chains and we got a lot of more distribution from our distribution network. We used to be distributed by the Wine and Spirits Network. Um, you know, we, we connected with RNDC and Alan Dreben, um, an executive there early on, just through Central Texas and being located here and in, in our network through UT Austin and things like that. And they were really, really good to us. But what ended up happening is, you know, we created this product as a five liter bag and box. And so it's a party size product. Um, but we found pretty quickly that it was really important for us to have a single serving version of our product that people could try easily and would also be good for these events. Right. Um, and so we created the 500 milliliter Tetra pack version of our product, which is really ideally sold at retail through the convenience channel. And so the wine and spirits network is awesome at what they do, but for our product, we were not especially a great fit just because they focus more on, grocery and the liquor channels than convenience, which is traditionally owned by the beer networks. And so um, also with our product being, you know, blue raspberry and fruit punch and pink lemonade, you know, we were being merchandised next to the Cabernets and, and the other wine products instead of in the fridge next to the other flavored items. Because again, those products are typically distributed by the beer networks. Um, even though we're wine based, you know, some of our competitors are seltzers or or malt-based uh, FNBs and things like that. So uh, we ended up, you know, after growing and testing out the Wine and Spirits Network and trying to do the business with the five liter, we actually ended up having to redo the whole business model around 2017, 2018, focusing on the single serve, you know, changed our whole distribution network back down to four states with the beer networks and then now have grown from there to, to cover the country. So it's been a, a steady you know, growth, I would say since we did that, it's everything's just been aligned since then. We're, you know, really good solution for our wholesale partners, for our retail partners. And, you know, consumers have loved us this whole time since 2014. And so, you know, we have 5,000 people on our store locator every day looking for this product. And so that's why we're just 
on a laser focus now that we've kind of figured out how everybody can be successful selling our product and, and scaling from there. That's awesome. So you went from a multi-serve product where you actually had, you know, I mean, and what you originally set out to do, which was making, um, uh, you know, box wine, um, that, that, um, um, actually cool and fun and, um, and, and, you know, an actual brand itself. I mean, I remember drinking a lot of box wine in college, um, but like, um, but making it, (laughs) making it cool and making it fun and, and, you know, adding like definitely like, um, uh, you know, just like an interesting differentiated element to it. Um, and as well as it tasted, it was, um, cause it wasn't kind of, um, your true traditional, um, what you'd buy in store. It was very, very different when it comes to taste. Um, and you, and you went and you, and you kind of, you flip that on its head a little bit and you actually then went to, to single serve, um, and actually had these, um, Tetra packs, um, that you use that was also quite, you know, differentiated in terms of what was, you know, on the market at the time. When I think of Tetra Pak, I think of like Zico coconut water and kind of these, uh, those types of products. And so that's also quite, quite unique. Yeah, there's a lot of benefits to bag and box and Tetra Pak packaging. Uh, we're, you know, representing the next generation of alcohol beverage also means, you know, being funny on social media, but also means embodying the values of our generation, which means being sustainable and inclusive and all those kinds of things. And so, um, you know, the bag and box and, and box packaging is much more carbon efficient because it's so lightweight compared to aluminum cans and, you know, other types of glass packaging or other things that alcohol might be in. Um, and so, you know, we were able to to max out the trucks and, and it's about 50% less carbon used uh, using that packaging with our formula and everything that we do. Um, so, you know, that's been something that we really have been committed to. It's not the easiest thing to explain to everybody, but there's a lot of other benefits too. It's resealable, which is great for the consumer. You know, they can choose whether or not they want to consume the whole beverage in one go or put it back in the fridge for a couple of months. Cause it's really like a, a great packaging for that. Um, it's also shelf stable. So for our retailers and wholesalers, there's long shelf life and lots of solutions there. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of great aspects to it that we like and it's differentiated. Um, I think we're kind of known for it now and I'm sure we'll, we'll see more people using that packaging because it's great. But, um, you know, I think we've been ahead on the game on, on it for a while now. No, that's awesome. And it's also really interesting, um, just to like reiterate, um, how you, um, how that packaging changing that going from like multi-serve to single serve really was, you know, an incredible boost for, um, uh, for beatbox and your business. Um, and really was kind of like a huge driver for it. Cause that led then to shifting from a distribution standpoint from like wine and, uh, wine and spirits, uh, to a beer distributor. Um, and then to get into, you know, kind of different use cases for it, like convenience stores and maybe, and also, um, and also different parts of the store that actually made a lot more sense than, than what it, what it was originally set out to be. Um, which I think that's like a really neat and I haven't heard that yet on the podcast, like quite an interesting, different, um, uh, way to actually pivot. Um, not so much like the product itself, but actually how it's packaged and the, all the different layers that kind of comes with it. Yeah. It's still blue raspberry punch. It's still the great music branding, but you know, it's, it's just figuring out, you know, all of the things you need to do to make a business in the alcohol beverage industry go, you know, it's a, like I said, it's a three tier system. And so you have to solve, you know, your, your investors problems, your employees problems, your wholesalers problems, your retailers problems before you can solve your consumers problems, you know, so we, it doesn't work unless it all works. <laughs> totally. How did you, I mean, even this way back, going back to the early days, how did you even think about when the product was right or what type of product you should even launch with or, you know, product innovation overall? For sure. So, you know, like I said, we were in business school and they were really focused on teaching us concepts like the lean startup. So doing a lot of market validation. Lucky for us, we're in Austin, Texas. It's a a big cocktail love in town. And so what we would do is just make prototypes of different, you know, packaging, different punch mixes, you know, every kind of mixer, every kind of juice or powdered mix or whatever we could find in the grocery store, we would just mix together and uh, make punch and take them to, you know, apartment complexes on the weekends that would turn into big pool parties or, or, you know, go over to, you know, a big uh, house where a lot of people lived and just ID everybody and, you know, see what they liked best, which packaging they liked best. And that's how we landed on 
the original sort of boombox design and blue raspberry punch flavors. Those, those were the ones that won all of our tests. And so we still have a very like crowd and community focused, um, you know, all of our sort of what you would call marketing programs are very community oriented. It's a very competitive industry. As we know, we can't outspend our, our multi-billion dollar competitors. And so uh, all of what our marketing has been is about word of mouth. And, and also that means listening to our customers. And so having groups of, you know, uh, we have like a discord, for example, of 4,000 plus super fans that we engage in conversations about what flavors should we do next? You know, what do you think about this packaging change or things like that? So we're always trying to still talk to uh, do a lot of testing before we do anything commercially. When you say community oriented, what exactly do you think about being like a community led brand or 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 a community oriented brand? Um, and how would that be maybe different to what previous or like an, an other, you know, alcohol or just any other brand that maybe wasn't community oriented? For sure. So, you know, we created a product from the perspective of the consumer, right? So we were coming at it not as, you know, multi-year alcohol beverage industry execs, but as consumers that wanted something different. And so uh, building the product, it was a group of friends. And so we had to figure out how to run the company in a way that we could build consensus with each other and we all had a, a voice. And so as we've hired more team members, like every single employee at Beatbox has equity in the company. And because we've done so much fundraising and we've even done crowdfunding through websites like WeFunder, uh, we have you know more than 2,000 plus investors. There's not one person that owns more than you know 15% of the company. And so it's truly a community built uh, business from you know our teammates that all have you know equity. I just consider them my business partners and even our fans now that if they participate in our WeFund are also have equity in the company. And so um, that's a really cool thing that we were able to do and kind of bring everybody in. But the, the whole idea behind Beatbox was, hey, we love music festivals and the idea of, uh, you know, bringing people together in, in togetherness in general. And, and that's just the personality of my co-founders and I, we just really love that more than anything else in life, bringing people together. And so, um, you know, from, from talking to our wholesalers and trying to include them through town halls and other kinds of listening metrics to, you know, the social media being, we're, we're considered the most engaging social media alcohol beverage brand because we have the most engagement of all of the brands and the most likes and comments and actual people talking with us on those platforms. And so, you know, the, the whole brand is basically tons of people in conversation around this theme. No, and I, thanks for, thanks for uh, mentioning and, uh, and sharing that, um, just how you also think about uh, community. How, how much do you focus, like, in terms of spending your time, how much do you think about, you know, your overall brand and the marketing and the look um, um, of it versus, you know, formulating and improving the actual product uh, itself. And how do you think about like the balance between these two things? Yeah. So, you know, we have a multifunctional sort of cross team innovation team. So it's like different leaders from different teams in our organization, you know, even with my, my partners, my partner, Brad covers our branding and marketing, and I actually cover the operations and manufacturing piece. And so, you know, bringing those different points into the conversation, like, Hey, you know, we really want to do this beautiful image, you know, and that's coming from branding. And then ops will say something like, okay, that's great, but can we put it into four colors so that we can optimize on costs or printing or whatever it is? And then, you know, like I said, it's important to build consensus. And so, so yeah, it's always just kind of back and forth. But for us, I mean, we're, we're building a premium lifestyle brand. It's not, you know, a commodity product. Uh, any, you can put any kind of a liquid in any kind of container and sell it. But when people are engaging with Beatbox, it's all about that, bringing that extra fun to the experience through the brand experience. And so we really, you know, kind of optimize for doing things that are new and different, but um, obviously have to weigh in all the operational concerns as well. Now with Beatbox, you then decided to, I guess, um, to found maybe a, a umbrella company, Future Proof, right? um that then has beatbox beverage under it right um what was kind of like that process of founding 
future proof. And it also, how did you also think about launching as well, other brands like Brizzy and then also Corkless Wine? Yeah. So uh, that was, you know, kind of around the same time that we switched Beatbox over to the beer networks. This is like 2017, 2018. Uh, We noticed that they were really losing a lot of share of, you know, liquid and sales to more traditional wines and spirits types products, you know, like uh, people were drinking more of the RTDs and things like that. And, and, and some of the beer wholesalers didn't really have a lot of those innovation products on their shelves. This is before the seltzer craze and the RTD craze, right? And so really Brizzy and Corkless were created as solutions for our wholesale partners. They loved that Beatbox was incremental dollars for them. They weren't trying to sell another beer. It was selling something they had never sold before. And so they had come to us asking for more products like that. And so we developed out a couple other brands. One was a a wine in a can, which could be distributed by the beer wholesalers. And then the other one was Brizzy, which was a craft cocktail, spirits inspired, um, you know, seltzer, but it was more full flavored than some of the other seltzers. Um, This is again around 2018. So before there was like 20,000 seltzers a month coming out. (laughs) But uh, yeah, those were the kind of the concepts uh, that we were going with just to provide, you know, wine and spirit solutions to our beer wholesaler partners uh, through things that they could sell, like sugar brew and, you know, wine in a can. And so that was the idea. And then March 2020 happened and it was not a good idea to launch any innovation brands. There's no music festivals, no sampling events, no way to introduce consumers to new brands. And so with the growth of Beatbox, Um, You know, we've just been focused on beatbox since that time. And so I I still think there's opportunity for, you know, brands uh, for the next generation of drinkers. But with with the rocket ship that's going with beatbox right now and the you know, the team that we have, we're just staying really focused. So right now it's focus on beatbox and then kind of put put a hold on Brizzy and Corkless. Is that is, is that roughly right? That's right. Yeah. And that's really just, you know, the whole, the whole reason why we created it was for our wholesale partners and to give them solutions. And at this time, you know, they, they have plenty of, of those types of solutions um, that have been coming to the market since 2018. Right. So um, Beatbox makes them good money and it's a fast growing brand and, and we're just all just laser focused on getting it in to more stores. It's, but at, I mean, at the same time, I think what's, what's really encouraging because I mean, I, obviously you are, um, growing really quickly and, and, and you're, you're really thriving, but it's, it's always hard getting into, you know, distribution when you are still like an emerging brand. Cause, um, because the, the big players kind of, you know, own that market share and that's really like the, the bread and butter of, of the distributors. So they're managing those relationships. And so it seems like what is beneficial is since beatbox is so different to what some of the other, other offerings, you're actually not trying to be competitive with some of the offerings in that, 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 that the distributor is serving. So you actually do have kind of a space there and that it seems like wouldn't be going away. And I think that's also really awesome that the d- distributors and wholesalers are actually coming to you and saying, Hey, how, what else can we kind of put in the pipe that you can kind of product innovate, which I think is really, really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, like I said, we, we can't get a product to market without them. So they really have to be engaged in anything that we're moving forward. Right. Totally. Totally. So what's, what's, I guess, happened since, you know, since March, 2020, I know beatbox has been absolutely on fire and and on a tear, but like, what were kind of like some of like the key drivers do you think? Because it, it almost went, I, I, I want to say against your orig- original mission as to why beatbox was initially created, right? Because you wanted to be the flavor for, you know, music festivals and have, you know, these kind of com- uh, community gatherings that beatbox is kind of would, would be the center or, or part of um, when, you know, that all of that evaporate, evaporated what seemingly was overnight back in March, 2020. How did you, I understand how you, how, how you adapted on the product side because you decided to focus all your energy on beatbox and instead of um and kind of uh, putting a pause on brizzy and corkless but what else what what else did you do to to double down on beatbox you know we originally got the single serve into some chains 
And, and, you know, for an independent brand, it's such a grind, right? When you present to a new chain, they're taking you in for the first time. They're usually testing you in a few stores with a couple SKUs. And it's up to you to prove to them that, you know, you're, you're going to be more profitable than another brand that they could put in the same place. And so, you know, it, it does take some time and several cycles with these buyers to get to earn that trust and to earn that space. And so that's kind of what we saw was the pro, the single serve product was introduced in 2018. We started getting some buy-in from some beer wholesalers. They started selling it, doing well with it, some chains. And then over 2019 and 2020, uh, we got into more distributors, more chains and more SKUs per chain, right? So it just kind of increases on all those metrics and uh, I think what happened was during the pandemic, people really focused in on convenience and off-premise, which is where we had been focused on. Because, you know, while this brand was built at music festivals, you know, most people don't go to music festivals every weekend. It's all just about having those memories and those fun times with your friends, even if you're just watching, you know, YouTube videos of your favorite bands on the couch, you know, just, just having that experience of being together with your friends. And so, you know, most people wanted to connect and wanted to have fun and wanted some happiness during 2020. And, you know, credit to my marketing team, we had to change all of the things that we were doing from events and samplings to refocusing back to what what people were doing online. And so uh, we we found this guy, I'm sure you remember him, Dogface. He was the guy that got on his skateboard and was just drinking cranberry juice and listening to Fleetwood Mac uh, cruising down the street. And so that just kind of encapsulated everything that we we wanted. He was just, you know, listening to music. He did bring that song and that music to a whole new generation. And it was just kind of like this fun moment of light during the pandemic that, um, you know, people kind of rallied around. And so he was just this guy, you know, dancing and, and having fun with music and making people smile. And that was just everything that Beatbox was about, too. And so we reached out to his team. And ended up doing that cranberry dreams flavor with them. And uh, when music festivals finally opened up in, in the back half of 21, uh, we got to take Dogface to his first music festival. And so he got to drink his cranberry alcohol drink with all of his fans at, at Rolling Loud in Miami. And so that was really fun experience. Um, just kind of full circle of, you know, us all going inside and having to go online and, and finding ways to connect with each other and smile and listen to music with each other. And then being able to do it in person, you know, after the the shutdown was over, it was like almost euphoric, you know, for everybody. So that was a really fun experience. And then today, our digital marketing, you know, has never been stronger. Like, like I said before, we have tons of people engaged online, um, I think, through some of the efforts that we did during the pandemic. And now that we have festivals and events going, it's just been such a such a flywheel of brand awareness and, you know, we've, we've been having more than 5,000 people on the store locator every single day looking for Beatbox. And so taking that data, showing that back to our wholesalers and retailer partners, and then quickly expanding store count as well. And so it's just been a grind. And, and like I said, everything's just working together now and, and we're riding the rocket ship as fast as we can. So I was going to ask how you leverage your content to drive sales and um, and kind of get people um, in retail because because you know with with alcohol you have the three tier system so you can't really sell online I mean there's maybe um, some ways to but it's it's um, it's more complicated but I guess you just answer that question in that what you do is when people come to your site they kind of punch in their zip code um, to enter um, or to be notified and then they can actually and then you actually are using that data to actually to, yeah to leverage that into actually getting into new um, r- retail chains. That's right. That's right. And uh, and to show to our wholesalers as well to get into more independent accounts as well. Say, hey, look, everybody's searching for it in this neighborhood. Like, we better get a display up going. And and, and a lot of what people are ask, asking for is their favorite flavors because we've got nine flavors and most stores only have like a few a few flavors. And so that's another great thing uh, to show retail buyers and wholesalers say, hey, everybody wants to try, you know, all of them. How do you also think about over, like um, on prem and what and and what like the types of um, uh, bars, restaurants that actually make sense for 
for Beatbox? Yeah, we've we've done some really cool things on prem. We're in a lot of music venues and stadiums. You know, everywhere that people are having fun, we want Beatbox to be. Um, I think it's got it's done really well too. You can you can put Beatbox in like a frozen margarita machine, and it slushes up perfectly with like a boozy slushy. And so that's something that a lot of folks have been doing on premise as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a big part of our strategy moving forward. I think we've really focused on the convenience channel first, and now we're breaking into more grocery on premise and liquor as well. Cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. What's one book that's inspired you personally and one book that's inspired you professionally? For personally, I would say Dan Siegel Mindsight. And so I always recommend it. Whenever I'm talking about entrepreneurship, I always feel like I need to talk about mental health. But basically, I'm a big nerd. And so this explained a lot of the science behind mental health and different practices and therapy and things like that. And so um, I appreciated all of that. I always think if you have a, a very difficult career where you put a lot on your brain, it's always good to learn uh, more about mental health and how to take care of yourself. And then professionally, um, as a founder, we use a system called EOS, Entrepreneur's Operating System. Um, so in addition to the books I mentioned earlier about market validation, like the Lean Startup, I would say the there's a book called Traction, Get a Grip on Your Business that teaches founders how to use EOS. It's a system that distills a bunch of best practices about how to run a company from goal setting to how to hire people to how to run your team meetings and things like that. So if anyone's engaged in the entrepreneurship process, I would definitely recommend checking that out. It's been really helpful for us at Beatbox. What's one piece of advice that you have for for any entrepreneur that's that's looking to start a business? Yeah, my biggest thing is always just, you know, back to the community piece. Every day as an entrepreneur, you have to do something you've never done before. And so you know, joining entrepreneur communities, joining um, consumer product communities, everything from Startup CPG to Naturally Network to the conferences that happen. Just make sure you're not completely staying closed and just, you know, it's such a grind working on a new startup, as we all know. And so I think it's just important to get out there and meet people because there, there's so many things that you have to do and, and that you've never done before that you just need somebody with experience to give you experience shares or recommendations. And so joining those communities, as well as like for the emotional support, just to be honest, uh, I think is very important to our success. Some of my best friends are, are other founders that have uh, helped me. And, you know, we've, I'm, in, I'm part of EO Entrepreneurs Organization. I'm, I just got back from my EO Forum Retreat. We've been together four and a half years. So meeting once a month for four hours for four and a half years with like eight other entrepreneurs. So um, it's been really helpful for me. Amy, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. Thank you so much. And um, thank you so much for having me. There you have it. It was so great chatting with Amy. I hope you all enjoyed listening. Again, if you're enjoying this episode, I highly recommend subscribing to the newsletter at theconsumervc.com for all episodes directly in your inbox, as well as a weekly roundup of all the venture deals happening.